From the HBA Podcast Studio in New York City, welcome to The Medium Rules. I'm Alan Baldishan. What is a blockchain network? You know, by creating this trust, blockchain is really like the best Lego block to, you know, build on top of. Let's, let's, let's talk about proof of stake. Sure. You know, why wouldn't everyone be proof of stake? It's a winner who's game. So one particular miner will win that block and everyone else loses. How do you ever win that? Wouldn't it be like, I'm playing Federer in tennis? And he's yeah. going to beat me 100 out of 100. Times. Joining me today in the HBA podcast studio are two gentlemen on the frontier of the blockchain industry. I'm joined today by Tom McLaughlin and David Watka, CEO and COO, respectively, of Blockstake Inc., a startup proof-of-stake crypto mining company which owns and operates a portfolio of master nodes on some of the top distributed networks or blockchains out there today. Today's pod is going to be a bit longer than usual because what I'd like to do is use this as an opportunity to not only learn about proof-of-stake mining, and how the block stake business fits into the broader crypto ecosystem, as well as the backstory of how and why the block stake founding team came together and landed on stake mining as a project, but also unpack some of the basic concepts I've just mentioned, such as blockchain, proof of stake, and master nodes. On the back end of the pod, we'll also talk about the broader crypto market, the massive pullback we've seen in crypto prices since December 2017, and where Tom and David see things going over the next 12 to 24 months in terms of trends. So with that, let's get started. Tom and David, welcome to The Medium Rules, and thanks thanks to both of you guys for being on here today. Thanks for having us. Um, So Tom, let's start with you, and let's start at the start. As succinctly as you can possibly get, which will be a challenge, uh, what is a blockchain network? Uh, basically, a blockchain network is a distributed database that keeps a list of records, um, and those records are kept in what are called blocks. Um, those are linked using a cryptography process to basically ensure that the list of transactions that has occurred up until that point cannot be altered. Now, that's really important because uh, basically when you're a participa- participant in a network, when you can codify this trust process, there's really, um, it takes a lot of the human element out of managing these networks. And it provides uh, basically an environment for networks to be able to transact in a peer-to-peer manner without having to rely upon a third party. Basically, the network can maintain itself. So what role does mining play and what role do coins play? in the operation of a blockchain network? Sure, so the the miners are incentivized basically to keep this uh, growing list of transactions. Uh, And now each miner maintains their own separate list of these transactions. Uh, The miner creates these new blocks and in return for doing that, they receive what are called block rewards or these newly minted coins uh, from the network. So they're incentivized by sort of a monetary process. Uh, The tokens themselves, uh, you can think about them as uh, sort of the mechanism by which you can transfer value between two network participants. And one of the examples we were kind of kicking around before was something like uh, Napster, which was one of the original peer-to-peer networks. Now, we can think of a, a blockchain on top of Napster you know, we could think about that process as adding a way to transact value. So imagine Napster, but people are able to basically buy and sell these songs with some sort of token that's native to that network. And one of the things that's really crucial for is when you're building a network, it's just better to have a native uh, currency to that network. Usually when sort of the problems come in is when you're trying to integrate some sort of fiat currency into this network where the network participants are all around the world, they use all different currencies, and then you're trying to basically funnel them all through this one door of PayPal or the US dollar. And that really was not how the internet was designed. The internet was designed in a global manner, um, and sort of these tokens really are just um, native digital currencies. When you say fiat currency, what do you mean? Uh, Fiat currency is basically referring to any government currency, uh, a currency that's uh, 
managed by some sort of Federal Reserve uh, okay. or a central banking system. Okay. Dollar, okay. Euro. Okay. Um, so when you say fiat currency wasn't really designed to work on the internet and, and you need a native coin to transfer value, can you just expand upon that because that might not be obvious to people listening to this podcast. In other words, if I want to transfer value, if I'm participating in Napster and I want to, let's say, get paid for making available 300 songs, yeah. just to continue that analogy, which I think is useful, presumably dollars would have worked like or, or not. Why, why do we need, why would we, in the case of Napster, have wanted to have a Napster coin, let's say? Sure. So when you're designing a network like Napster, you want to make it as inclusionary as you can. So you want people in Afghanistan, the United States, Canada, basically every crevice of the world, you want it to be accessible to them. Um, and you run into a problem when you're trying to uh, basically transact somebody in the United States with somebody in Africa. You have to go through sort of this portal to switch the U.S. dollar into some sort of currency that that other person would want. Now, you can change that process by uh, sort of injecting a token directly into the network. So if I'm on the network and I'm using Napster, and let's say hypothetically there's a Napster coin, I can pay that person in Africa for the song that they've uploaded. I can pay them in Napster coin, and they can decide to hold on to that, or they can change it into their own uh, sort of local currency. Or into Bitcoin. Correct. Yeah, and, and Bitcoin, I think that's a good segue. Bitcoin really came out about this idea that we transact different online than we do in person, and the internet needed a native digital currency. Now, whether or not that is Bitcoin long term, we don't know. But as of right now, that was sort of the idea behind Bitcoin was to have a currency that is uh, directed by code. Um, that creates an environment of trust for everyone. Everyone can see all the transactions. Everybody knows how many new Bitcoin are being created. And uh, that, that's really a stark contrast to sort of the monetary systems in place, uh, especially in the US. You know, we have a, a central bank that decides the supply of new dollars. Um, and so when you think about Bitcoin, it's the scarcity and it's the global sort of appeal that we can now transact across borders that, you know, in a trusted, in a, in a, I, I, or in some sense, the inverse trust list, because you don't require trust with a central authority. Correct. Correct. Dave, let me segue to you and say, the way I'm understanding this, and, and I'm going to continue on our Napster analogy and maybe try and segue into mining, but the, the more popular Napster net becomes, in our analogy of Napster being a blockchain, the more value there is to, the more robust that network becomes and the coins have more value because more people want to join the network, have credits to operate, do transactions on the network. Is that roughly correct? Yeah, so the, if we take the Napster analogy, with, which is a great one, and Kind of forget the fact that okay Napster was a peer-to-peer -peer network. It worked great. Um, kind of put aside the the legal content, the copyright, the copyright issues, laws yeah. with the song, but yeah. it was a medium of exchange where people all over the world had a Napster uh, program, a piece of software that ran on their computer. Uh, and if I wanted a Red Hot Chili Pepper song, I could find it somewhere, and it'd be hundreds of thousands of people that had it. The more people that have that song, the quicker my download was. I could get parts from you, parts from you, parts from somebody else uh, all over. So the more, not only the more people that were on the network, the more people had that Red Hot Chili Pepper song I was looking for, the quicker my download was. But if we think about Napster in a tokenized world where a one song costs one Napster coin to download, the value of that coin held, held some monetary value. You could equate it to a Bitcoin value or a dollar value. Uh, but the more people that come on the Napster network and participate in that, the more demand there will be for Napster coins. If there's a fixed supply of them, which is what Bitcoin has taught us, and the contrast to the Federal Reserve and the banking system we have now is we have a, a set schedule and a set inflationary value of Bitcoin supply or Napster coin supply where we know there's only going to be a total, in Bitcoin's example, 21 million coins. We have roughly 
17 million today and we know the supply is increasing at a fixed percentage over time versus the Federal Reserve can decide to print 10 billion more dollars tomorrow. Which by the way, I, I, I want to come back to that when we talk about, um, when we get into the mining conversation because I don't know that not a lot of people realize that with respect to these networks, the coins that are being minted are finite and how that process plays out over time. So absolutely. that's, yeah, that's, that's absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, but again, so okay, if Napster coin in this example is a finite supply, then the more people come on the Napster network and want to download songs or upload songs in exchange for money, the more value one Napster token holds. So if it starts at a dollar a token, the more participants in the network, the more demand for the fixed supply Therefore, the value of the price will go up as it's traded on secondary markets. And, and this is a pretty critical point, I think, because that's what distinguishes successful networks from unsuccessful networks and why some coins will increase in value and others will decrease because it will be a function of how well designed, how well operated, how smart the engineering, how popular the application. Um, so, you know, not all blockchain networks are the same. Some are going to be successful because they're going to attract a lot of people, whether, you know, it's, it, whether they're building on top of or whether they're a core fat layer. And I don't want to get too technical, but I, I guess the point I'm making is, you know, the t when you're thinking about a blockchain network and you're thinking about picking coins, Due diligence with respect to that network is critical. What, who are the engineers behind it? Um, what's their background? What do you think of the use case? Um, and you know that's part of distinguishing between scams and networks that have long-term value and will appreciate. Yeah, and I think there's a, a stigma out there on cryptocurrency in general that all cryptocurrency is meant to be money or is meant to replace dollars, and and that. That's really not the case. There's thousands and thousands of great applications out there for different, we prefer to talk about crypto assets because there's things called utility tokens. In the case of Napster, it would be a utility token. You could trade this coin for music. Uh, not everything's meant to be a peer-to-peer -peer payment network where I pay right. you for my deli sandwich or pay you to purchase your car. Um, not everything's meant to be a a unit of money for traditional money purposes, right. but a, a medium of exchange for a what's becoming what we believe is going to be more and more of a tokenized world where these platforms and these values of exchange uh, will hold more value and be able to transact with each other in their own native currency and will integrate that system to be more effective. So let's talk about, so, so, so taking that, let's segue into one of, one of the things that uh, I think the whole notion of mining solves among, among others is the quote unquote problem of scale with respect to blockchain networks. So talk about how mining solves or, or, or is an attempt to solve the problem with scale because as more and more people are on this network, the amount of transactions just is, goes up and up and up and up and exponentially and presumably more and more computing power is needed. Is that a correct way of thinking about the, the issue of scale with respect to blockchain networks and where mining comes in, at least partially? Sure, and, and again, kind of what Tom was talking about, it's based on trust and the way we value the trust and we respect the trust is through an effort put into by the miners. So the miners play a very critical role in, in the recording of that ledger, the formation, the tracking of all those transactions that form the blockchain that create this immutable ledger is the word really that says that you have a certain balance and that you sent Tom uh, 10 tokens and therefore you had 100 now you have 90. The record is kept by the miners and what the miners actually look like can be a number of different ways. It kind of started out as Bitcoin miners is what's called a proof of work mining system. So what that physically looks like is it looks like machines. They're hardware machines, uh, miners that are now, now are now specially made and there's a very fixed demand, there's a very demand and a limited supply of these machines. So for me to start a a Bitcoin mining operation, I need to go purchase some significant hardware. So if you need to make a capital investment in a in an asset, it's a depreciable asset, but it's still an asset. Uh, they're made by only a fixed number of suppliers. China is the leading supplier. A company called Bitmain is the leading supplier 
of um, what's called ASIC miners, which is the, the most efficient, the fastest, the most yeah, hash power. Application powered. specific. Yeah, it's an application specific uh, computer, essentially, as opposed to, not that you couldn't run it on a laptop, but it's just much more efficient. So they have this specialized technology hardware. So you gotta buy a lot of this hardware. Now you need the space to put it. So typically you see people renting warehouse spaces. So you rent the warehouse space, you install this hardware, you gotta wire it together, you plug it into a power source. Uh, these things give off a lot of heat, so you need a ventilation system in there. So it's a whole physical setup just to start running. So it's a big capital investment. It takes some physical space and technical know-how to plug it in. And then you have a pretty consistent drain on an electrical source, an electrical cost, and a physical maintenance cost to maintain these machines. But once these machines are up and running, once we've gotten to that point, the way that they become a trusted participant in the network is by verifying transactions on the blockchain, it's something that's called proof of work. So the work is not only the work you've done up to that point to purchase this system and put it into place, configure it, and configure it and maintain it. And and it's got to have a connection to the internet and run run a, a software program that transacts with the Bitcoin network in this example. And, and by the way, just for the visual, I mean, these are massive warehouses full of thousands of these very expensive machines. Yes, yes server running. farms. Yeah, they're basically, basically server, server farms. farms. Yeah. There are people that have one or two machines in their basement. I certainly know a couple people that, that do that. Uh, but yes, the for-profit businesses of these yeah. are massive farm, massive warehouses, and they're usually in locations where they have low cost of energy. So right. let me interject. I think this is a later point, but one of the problems that we see with this process is that that group of people that are able to actually mine those networks, it goes from you know how many of how many billion people in the world. We're narrowing that down to crypto folks, but now you need to have the warehouse space, you need to have the miners, you need to have the electricity, you need the technical knowledge. So And the capital and the wherewithal to raise the capital. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so what we're seeing in proof of work networks, specifically Bitcoin mining, is we've gone from anybody who liked Bitcoin back in 2011 could conceivably run a miner out of their apartment and they would do pretty well. That doesn't happen anymore because it's all become centralized off economies of scale. So you have people in China that get government subsidized electricity, they have access to the best mining equipment, and they're crushing everyone else. And it basically, you know, when you're talking about a decentralized network, when the people mining the transactions go from all of the network participants to 10 people in a room, that's really scary. And I think that's a legitimate problem with that model moving forward. That's it. Okay, so that's great. So, but let me ask you this because I think there was one maybe incomplete thought, and then I'd love you, uh, Tom, to contrast to proof of stake mining. But I think a lot of people have heard about this this uh, Bitcoin mining concept solving hard math problems. Mm -hmm. What? How does that come into play in a proof of work? mining blockchain what 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 kind of math problems are they solving and what how, how does the, how does solving math problems relate to verifying transactions so basically when they're solving these math problems they're basically running computer programs to come up with an exact string of numbers and the first miner that can get that exact string of numbers they become eligible to uh, create the next block and so they get that block reward and so the more electricity you have behind it, the better chance you have of solving that you know, 25 to 250 string of letters that's going to unlock the ability to create the next block on the blockchain. Uh, and that, and, and without interrupting, and, 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 by, and your right to create the next block on the blockchain is also the right to verify transactions and get the rewards? Yes, yeah, so you, when you unlock that string, it means that you create, you're the first person to submit the next block. And so every other miner will also have to verify those transactions and submit that same block, but it's just the first person that is able to unlock that string of numbers that's actually able to create that um, transaction like layer that goes into the next block. Okay. So every miner is always simultaneously, you know, keeping log of these transactions. It's just who is the first person to be able to post that to the network. Okay. 
and it's a win or lose game. So one particular miner will win that block and everyone else loses, gets nothing. Correct. And, until and now they process every about every 10 minutes or so is a Bitcoin block. How do you ever win then? In other words, in proof of work mining, wouldn't the same guy, wouldn't it be like I'm playing Federer in tennis? And he's yeah, going to beat me 100 out of 100 times. And that's pro- part exactly. of the problem. That's part of the problem. Now, there are mining pools that... Maybe 99. I mean, yeah, there are mining pools that people that have, you know, a couple miners in-house uh, aren't competing with the big guys in, in China, but they may have, you know, thousands of other people that pool their resources together. So if one person out of that entire pool gets the block reward, then they all share an equal piece of it relative to the amount of hash power, the amount of work they're putting into it. So okay. it's inherently one of the... Uh, increasingly difficult problems that's coming up with a proof of work system uh, and that's not just Bitcoin but it's all proof of work systems in that way and and while that's kind of been a natural evolution from the the process that Satoshi Nakamoto created I'm not sure that's kind of in the spirit of the whole crypto universe whereas it's really you know money for everybody supply for everyone everyone's going to be an incentivized participant in the network to share relatively equally in those rewards. So if it's centralized to a handful of players that have a proven skill based on their geographical whereabouts, the electricity supply, the source Maybe of the government market, intervention. Government yeah. intervention. Yeah. You know, that they, they those people are stacking the deck. Gotcha. And good for them. It's a very leveraged, smart business decision. Um, but it's it's taking a little bit away from the, the whole ethos of the crypto world on a, on a on a morality or a... Yeah, in a moral yeah, standpoint. The, the yeah, the philosophy of... Exactly. Let, let me, let, with, so without meaning to get too, 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 too deep into proof of work, because really more we're here, here to talk about proof of stake. So Tom, why don't you segue into what a proof of stake network is, um, and also, you know, why wouldn't everyone be proof of stake? Why would Bitcoin, for example, because... You know, Ethereum is moving to proof of stake. Is Supposedly. the word? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Maybe. <laughs> you know, what, what, will Bitcoin? Like, let's 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 talk about proof of stake. Sure. So, the the end goal for any of these networks and verifying these transactions is you want to have consensus. You want every node. A node is basically a participant or one um, sort of. I would think of it like a a cell phone tower in a network of cell phone towers. A node is one of those. And you want all of the cell phone towers that are keeping the logs of these transactions to be exactly the same. And so you're trying to incentivize as many of those as possible. Now, proof of stake, the idea behind it is rather than uh, putting all this money into hardware and going through that process to get consensus, Uh, Basically, the person who's able to create the next block uh, is directly proportional to the amount of tokens that you hold of that network. So in the Bitcoin model, we said it's kind of just random chance, right? But the more electricity you have, the better of a chance you have to mint that next reward. Now, in proof-of-stake networks, they kind of take that competition out of it, and basically, if they're... To simplify this, if there are a thousand coins on the network and I own a hundred of them and I'm participating in a proof of stake mining uh, you know, pool, uh, basically I will get 10% of the block rewards. And we take all that inefficiency out of uh, basically all the money and the value leaving the network. Uh, so that's basically. And what hardware do you need to, to be a, a, a node or, or a master node, which you'll explain? Um, what does that look like to be a master node, to, 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 to run a master node in a proof of stake mining network? Yeah, great question. So basically, the hardware is eliminated. Um, what we are doing when you're stake mining or proof of stake mining is you're running the same software um, of that network and you're verifying the transactions, uh, except what's uh, well, well, let me ask you that. I mean, is it yeah. more than a laptop and an internet connection to be a proof of stake? Yeah, the, mine? the beauty of it is it's just that. It's, a, it, it's an iMac, uh, a software program that's an open source coded software program. Anyone can download on virtually any laptop. Uh, and it's an internet connection. That's really the limit yeah. of the supply you need of the physical hardware investment. So 
uh, you buy a laptop or you have a laptop and an internet connection, which who doesn't have, and you're eligible, you have to buy, you have to you purchase have to stake some, some point, coins, correct, right? right? So uh, an example of a proof of stake network would be NEO. Uh, NEO is what's being held as the Chinese Ethereum. It's a Chinese smart platform. I thought Waves was the Chinese Ethereum. There's a couple. Sure. <laughs> there's a lot of them. Uh, there are a lot, there's a lot of them. So NEO works very simply as a proof of stake network. So NEO has its own tokens. Uh, you can de- go to go to their the website and download a Neon wallet, uh, which is the open source software wallet. So is it's, it buggy or is it decent? It's good. It's okay. decent. There's updates okay. that come out all the time. Okay. Uh, so you download that that program to your computer, uh, and then you open a new wallet account. So it gives you an address, a public key, and a private key to keep it secure. Uh, that that network is also compatible. That wallet is also compatible with um, uh, the Nano Ledgers, which makes a a cold storage device that keep the access to those keys uh, offline. I'm going to pause and say, just maybe explain yeah. cold storage. Sure. Yeah, so basically all of these tokens, you can access them through a key. Uh, and basically cold storage, what that basically And a key is, is not a physical key, obviously. It's string a string of data. String of data. String and of and data. those who might have, if you've ever had Microsoft Office, they give you a key. It's yeah, like that. It's, it's a, like letters. It's like twenty. It could be a twenty-five or letter, a like capital Q, lowercase r, right. seven, Random. four, <laughs> i, p. It, it, you're not. That's not your case, right? <laughs> no. Exactly. So that when you have that string of letters, that basically gives you the key to unlock uh, the tokens you have. And so basically, the idea behind cold storage is you don't want to leave that string of data online right. because somebody's going to hack it. So. What you can do is, theoretically, you could write down that string of letters on a piece of paper. You can also keep it in your head, but most people need some other medium, and so there are actual physical USB devices that stores that data, um, and basically you can keep your Bitcoin or any other crypto currency in that wallet. Um, I think to hop back, why isn't everybody doing proof of stake? Well, I mean, quite frankly, in the past two years, most people are. Um, it's just been kind of a natural shift. I don't think anybody, when Bitcoin came out, anticipated this problem of five people controlling the mining power um, in one room at the consensus conference. Nobody saw that problem because it's only happened now that there's been this scale. Um, and so, you know, some of the early proof of stake networks, one is called Steemit. Um, you, you've seen that the transactions per second that it can handle is just so much greater. They're running, you know, three plus million transactions per second, whereas Bitcoin is capped, you know, pre-Lightning Network at about 15 or 20. Why is the block time, which is the transaction speed, that's the, the word for transaction speed on a blockchain network, why is it so much quicker with proof of stake? It's really because you can have more of these, um, you can have a more distributed network of people processing the transactions. And so they can, you know, it was just kind of rewriting the rules of how do we get to that consensus. So they've done things like you can increase the block size, um, you can not wait as many, you know, what they call confirmations for a transaction. So basically, because you have um, these nodes on a network that have a state. So we're running a node. Um, we've also got, you know, a 10,000 10, of whatever token it is. Uh, basically, if we try to screw over the network, we lose that stake. And so there's just a, a greater level of trust in that, you know, um, every one of these nodes is going to do what they're supposed to do. And so because you know that, uh, it just allows for a lot quicker transaction a lot less latency between the different network participants okay um, let's do this let's jump into uh, your guys business um, you are a proof-of-stake mining company what does that mean Tom why don't you take a crack at that yeah sure. what, what is the block state business um, you know in a nutshell So basically we own and operate a number of those specialized nodes we were talking about. Um, On proof of stake networks only. On proof of stake networks. We do own some proof of work coins. Bitcoin is like the native currency to crypto. So we need to own that to buy other coins. Mm -hmm. Um, Basically we identify uh, networks that we think are well positioned. We acquire their currency um, and then we stake that 
um, in a lot of senses, we put it into a node as well, a specialized node with that collateral that we acquired, the number of tokens. Um, we run that node with the collateral attached, so that helps process the transactions, but the end goal really for us is um, we earn mining fees from these networks. So we put up a chunk of money, um, we help to kind of uh, spread out the network by you know, another node, so we're stabilizing the network, and in return for doing that, uh, we earn these new block rewards. So basically we're- Which are token, which are more tokens of that network, the native tokens of that network. Correct. Which you then do what with the, do you well, so the, reinvest those, do you put them on other networks, diversify? Yeah, so our business plan, our business model allows the profit in two ways. So number one, it's the cash flows from the mining rewards we're collecting, right? We don't own or operate a single proof of work miner, but we're participating in many proof of stake networks and a lot of these special master nodes, which we can go into a little bit more, but that becomes eligible to receive mining rewards and, and dividends. It's a volume based fee we collect from the network for being a good actor on the network. So we profit from, from the mining rewards and we also profit from any price appreciation in the assets we hold. So again, contrasting to a um, proof of work network, we instead of buying hardware machines that while they're an asset that you can list on the balance sheet, it's a depreciable asset because it'll lose value over time. We buy, in the case of NEO, we buy a thousand NEO, let's say, which is at a certain price, so that NEO never goes away. So that NEO earns us dividends if we get paid in more tokens. Um, but we all by, by, staking that, a master by staking a node on the NEO network, right. we receive volume-based dividends based on our thousand NEO, let's say. Um, but we also hold the NEO, so if and when the price of NEO fluctuates up or down, we ride that wave, and we're, we're obviously big believers that the whole crypto market, while we are in the middle of a pullback right now, will continue to expand over the next several years. Sure. So we profit that from that price appreciation and the mining reward. So short term, we get these supplies that come to us every few minutes. We get a, you know, a small piece of new coins constantly coming. And then you ask, what do we do with them? Well, we're holding them and reinvesting them, but it also lets us sell some of them off and invest in other projects. So as we Take more, get more cash flows in. We can diversify our portfolio, and there's always more, more projects and more great um, uh, use cases coming out for blockchain. So it allows us to diversify our portfolio, go out for other opportunities. It also lets us to uh, sell off some of those rewards to fuel our operating costs of the business as well too. So it's kind of a, it's nice that it's a self-sustaining business model that we use our capital, we purchase these assets, we become eligible to receive cash flow based on these assets. And again, if the when, if and when the market goes up, we profit even more from the price appreciation, but short term, we were always making money regardless of whether the market goes up or down that given day. So, so, so just so people know, you know, you, you, there is a minimum amount of coins you need to hold and stake, in effect, put in escrow to be able to operate a master node. Correct. So um, there's, and there's, I, I just want to give a re, I just want to, I apologize Dave, and then we'll let you jump in. We're going to link to uh, websites that are specifically targeted towards master node investors and people operating the master node system, which tell you how many master nodes you need, I'm sorry, how many coins you need to operate a master node, what the block rewards are, um, and one's master nodes online, and the, the, the master nodes live right uh, and i think that's one of the great parts about this as well is all of that is completely transparent so each of these separate tokens is really just a, a piece of software and so coded into it are different parameters um, and one of them in a lot of the cases happens to be this master node feature which what they're trying to do is they're trying to get someone to create a node keep track of those list of transactions but also uh, basically prove that you have skin in the game um, and the more skin in the game the greater the rewards you get uh, so. you know what's amazing is is the incentive this is all built by humans and there are human incentives rewards that are pulling people in to help sustain and build up the success of these blockchains so you know you can think about it in those terms yep. uh, just to give an example for example dash is a, I guess, a hybrid proof of stake and proof of work. That's one that people know about. Um, 
one dash coin is I think today something like two hundred nine dollars. Mm -hmm. You need a thousand dash coins to operate a master node. So right. today, if you wanted to operate a dash master node, you'd have to come up with two hundred nine thousand dollars. Correct. So that's expensive. Obviously, there are many proof of stake blockchains with master nodes which are much more in reach. And uh, I would say, Dave, that you know, part of the special sauce of a proof of stake mining company is figuring out how to allocate your assets, which uh, blockchain, uh, which, which, which networks you believe in, which teams diligencing them, so on and so forth. That's, that's in some sense what you're bringing to the table. Yeah, so we look for opportunities across, there's kind of three different tokenized reward structures and that's what we're going after. We want to be paid in these cash flows from tokens. So one of them is a traditional proof of stake model, which NEO is a good example of. NEO, there is no minimum amount. There is no NEO master node, so to speak. You could stake one NEO, you could stake 10,000 NEO, and you'll get the same proportional rewards. Uh, Dash is a good example of a master node network. So uh, if you have 50 Dash, you get nothing. You need a thousand Dash minimum to come to the table, form a master node. So that is your your stake in a, in a master node for Dash. So you have to have, like you said, $209,000 today which is a good chunk of cash in order to be eligible. And then you have to then have the technical skill, because it's not a hardware skill, but it's a technical skill to have that software program running with your money on that network, secure by- Connect your coins to the network. Connect your coins to the network, yep. run the software, and have server space. So the master node acts as a, a it records the transactions of the network, and you have to have a server space to store it. So either you have your own server, or you rent a cloud server space, um, so there's a there's a communication there, there's a software, there's a money uh, minimum just to get in the door. And again, going back to the whole idea of trust is, you know, by putting your thousand dash on the table, your two hundred nine thousand dollars on the table, and says, hey, I'm going to behave wisely and smartly, and I'm going to be a trusted participant, or I'm going to lose my money. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and then there's kind of a, a third aspect to our business too, on um, that are investments in networks that aren't necessarily proof of stake uh, that still have a function that would pay dividends out to. Uh, and that I think is a growing a growing part of the market that doesn't exist um, to the extent that other proof of stake networks do. Um, but so one of the projects, and this is becoming more common on, on some of these ICOs, one of the projects we're very excited about is a project called Mivu. Uh, that's M-E, so me versus you. It's a peer-to-peer -peer sports betting platform. Um, uh, led by a, a great, a smart team in uh, in Toronto, uh, and these guys are. I like Toronto. Good huh. Shout out for my hometown. Yeah, fellow Canadians. Yep. Yeah. Hey. Uh, so these guys are, are creating a sports betting platform built on blockchain, which is a great use case of blockchain. I think um, there can be a lot of blurriness these days in cryptocurrency and what that really means. But a, an application is su is super clear this way with um, sports betting. Okay, peer to peer. So Tom and I make a bet e each other about. Uh, you know, the Yankees versus the Royals game. And, you know, we have this network that built with these trusted third parties that verify the transaction that confirm, okay, we wagered uh, 10 tokens against each other. Uh, so Mibu is built on the Ethereum network. Again, it's an ICO in progress that we think holds a lot of value. And, and somebody that we partnered with very early on is uh, we can provide a value to them. And then it's a strategic investment for us in the Long term so well. you're going to buy the coins in the ICO, or, or, but you're not going to, do you have to stake the coins? Exactly. So we stake the coins. So Ethereum, so Mibu is based, built on Ethereum. So there is no proof of work yet with Ethereum. They say they're going to... Proof of stake. Proof, proof, proof of stake. Right. Sorry. Thank you. It's only proof of work right now. Right. There is no proof of stake model to staking Ethereum. But what you can do on this uh, new ICO, this new sports betting platform that's coming out, is you could stake your Mibu tokens and report game scores. So they okay. have this oracle okay. function, whereas, yeah. so Blockstick as business is not going to be betting on the Yankees beating the Royals, even though Tom and I are big fans. Right. What we are going to be doing is staking our coins and then reporting the game score. So when the Yankees beat the Royals 5-3, we can report that. And, you know, because, okay, otherwise, how do you verify who wins all these different bets across the network? So by reporting that, uh, you know, this team beat that team, this horse won the race, uh, that you know, Croatia beat Russia in the World Cup. By reporting all these results, we verified other people's bets, and so the, when those bets are settled, a cut 
a small transaction fee of those bets goes to the people that verify so the pretty yeah, yeah, So it's kind of like, yeah. it's like a new age of mining. It's you're verifying these transactions, but you're not actually a physical miner on the network. We would have to have a proof of work Ethereum mining operation to mine and verify the transactions of the network, yet we're supporting the platform and being paid a dividend fee based on being a good actor, staking our money to say that we're a good actor and we're a trustful actor by reporting these game scores, we collect a small dividend. That's interesting. So it's a, a new creative yeah. concept that we're very excited about both this particular project and there's other ones along the way that have this Oracle function to them. Yeah, I, I'm personally very excited about prediction markets, sports betting, um, any of these sort of industries that are highly regulated where you have um, an intermediary who seemingly does not provide that much value but yet charges exorbitant fees. And I mean, the, the very basic one is the, the sports book, right? They charge 10, 15, sometimes up to 20% to take one wager. Um, and now if you can codify that process where I'm gonna bet on Yankees, David's gonna bet on the Mets, why don't we just put that into uh, some sort of software program that will automatically pay out based on the result of that. And instead of a 10% fee that each of us pay on that money, we pay 2%. That, to me, that's the kind of value that a blockchain can provide. And that's something that has legs beyond just the small crypto community. Like that is, Game changing uh, industry, sort of shaking, disrupting. Up. Exactly. Yeah. You, you, in other words, you've you've completely upended the sports book market. Correct. And you know, a lot of. I mean, yes, we're seeing legalized sports books now, but a lot of the sports betting that takes place online right now is me depositing money onto an offshore bookie account. Yeah. I don't know if I'm ever going to get it out. They price gouge people and. You know, you really just, there's no transparency in that process. So Mevu is in effect a sports book on the blockchain. Correct. Yeah. But yeah. we, you hold on to the funds at all times and there's no like third party risk. Right. So. And you're not in this sort of sketchy offshore. Now we know gambling, gambling has been legal as or the anti-gambling laws have been struck down by the court. We'll see how that evolves, Supreme Court. But that's a, that's a great... That is a great use case, yeah. and that's something you guys are looking at, obviously. Yeah, it's something we've invested yeah. in already and okay. are, are excited to support that. So the ICO is in progress right now. The yes. ICO is an initial point of Yeah, so, so just to kind of expand the analogy on blockchain as a whole is that, okay, with your offshore sports betting account, uh, there's an element of trust that's lost along that way, so I'm trusting that my money is going to be safe in this offshore account. And that your credit cards aren't going to get hacked. <laughs> yeah, your credit card, your bank account's going to get hacked. Yeah. A lot of them have, you a, know it will. A lot of have a minimal amount to withdraw from. Right. So if you win a $10 bet, you can't always get that money. And then if and when you do hit the withdraw button, you know, how long does it take? How many business days of transaction, right? Days. You're also taking credit risk week. and bankruptcy. You have no idea. Yeah. So, so these no guys idea. go get raided, boom. So they get done. paid in my account, in my, let's say, Chase Bank account. That may take three to five business days to withdraw that money. Where, you know, whereas we're talking about block times of two to five minutes in a lot of these networks. So you get the verified and paid in your actual wallet almost instantaneously relative to an offshore bank account that you're not sure is trustworthy and that takes days to get paid if you get paid at all. So let me, let me, let me ask you guys, uh, how did you, one of the things that's really interesting, I think are really, really fun, so to speak, about blockchain is it's so new that really no one's coming at this with such a necessary, like it's really open to everyone. And you know, you guys, you're a four founder team um, you, each of your backgrounds is different, and I'm not necessarily saying sort of go into the bio of each of, of, of you guys and your two other co-founders that aren't with us today, but how did you come together and decide as Blockstake co-founders that this was where you wanted to land with respect to a startup in the blockchain uh, ecosystem? Yeah, so I mean the, the founding story of Blockstake, basically there's four co-founders. Um, I've been friends with each of them separately. Um, I got, I personally got into the crypto game a couple of years ago. It started with Bitcoin. Um, about two years ago, I started full time just trading crypto on a bunch of like really weird uh, different exchanges in like God knows where. Uh, Mel Gox? Was that uh, uh, I was ever? A, I was a little bit after that, okay. thankfully, um, like pretty soon after that. but. 
uh, actually a very like similar environment to what we're dealing with now with like kind of like the crazy bull market and then bear market. But back to Blockstake, uh, basically I knew I wanted to do something in this space. I initially uh, was thinking about doing an ICO in the sports space. Uh, I met up with these guys and we all were just talking about investing in cryptocurrencies. Um, we had the idea of starting a fund. Um, and as we kind of got down that process more and more, we started noticing uh, this very apparent shift from the traditional proof of work networks to the proof of stake networks. And the more we kind of dug into that, the more it kind of made sense to us that um, this it shouldn't be a fund. This is an actual business. We're providing a service and it's a, it's a much needed service to the fastest uh, growing area of crypto. And so um, within sort of the bounds of what we each brought to the table, this made a lot of sense. Um, my background, I started off on Wall Street. I've been uh, an entrepreneur in uh, various industries now since I've been in college. Um, and we have Dave, who's our COO. He comes from a construction background, but also just a very savvy investor. Sean is also, uh, he's our biz dev. Sean guy. Diamond. Sean Diamond, he's a, a Wall Street guy as well. Um, and then Earl, who's sort of our wild card, Earl Myers, he's our uh, director of marketing. He has a Wall Street background, but now he's in the creative area. Um, so, and he's deep into coin research. Yes, he's also like a, one of the other like sickos that goes into like the really low market cap coins. Um, but that you need that. We do. Uh, yeah. Obviously, you need that. You that's know, where that's where you're going to make your your skin. So that's where the greatest opportunity. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, I mean, we all came together. Um, this idea wasn't what we initially like ran after. It only became more and more apparent the longer we were, you know, sort of dealing with. Um, these other sort of business models that we were going after. It just became more and more apparent to us that this is going to end up being a really crowded space and we want to be the first movers in that space. Dave, how did you, what, what, what's your sort of perspective on this being the business where you guys landed versus doing some other things you could have done in, in crypto? Yeah, so I think this idea of pooling assets together starting a for-profit business that acts as a stake miner, we call it masternode stake miner, similar wording, but a stake yep. miner on several networks is a, is a pretty smart idea to deploy our capital, diversify our risk, but also put them in smart places where we're going to get cash flows and daily returns, as well as, like you said, identifying early on growing projects, being early in on price and watching and experiencing that price movement upward as the market uh, gains steam as each certain these individual projects become more and more valued. Uh, so the business model of having, so we have a C-Corp, so we have shares of stock of our company. Um, so, and then our real future vision is to bring this company to the larger capital market. So uh, our goal is to bring Blockstake to the TSXV, which is the Toronto Stock Venture Exchange right. in Canada. Um, which is a very friendly environment for early, well, early venture style businesses going public. Yes, and there's already several crypto companies, blockchain companies that are already public on the Toronto Stock Exchange, whether it's the main exchange or the venture exchange. Uh, so it's a very friendly community there. Um, the SEC, we think, is coming along those lines, but uh, right now the SEC is still in subpoena mode for uh, sequestering information from blockchain, blockchain companies, whereas the Toronto Stock Exchange is posting a webinar, webinar series on why you should bring your blockchain business to Canada. So it's a very friendly environment. Well, really with sophisticated investors and sophisticated regulators, and yes. let me just interject and say what's going on so people are aware is that the SEC is focused on ICOs which haven't uh, complied with the securities laws. Um, and, uh, you know, whether it be registered uh, tokens as securities, whether it be have not registered for them for resale, many people listening to this would, would know that that's a big area of um, concern uh, for the U.S. blockchain industry. And um, not that it's bad or good, it's, it's definitely slowed down momentum for uh, blockchain companies looking to sell uh, coins to U.S. investors. Exactly. We get asked all the time, are you guys doing an ICO? No, we're not doing an ICO. We're not creating block state coin. Uh, 
Well, you right. don't have a network. That's you no, network. nor do we intend to create one. Yeah. We want to be a participant and a trusted actor and to provide this infrastructure and this service in exchange for the cash flows and rewards that come from it across several networks. So, well, our goal is to bring this product. So, yes, we have a registered security with the SEC. We have a stock of a traditional company that's registered. Uh, so when we bring that stock to the public markets on the Toronto Stock Exchange, Venture Exchange is our goal. We want to be able to bring this opportunity to everyday retail investors. So both institutional and retail investors, you could some days, hopefully soon, participate in and own a piece of the crypto market, a piece of our company, a piece of uh, crypto stake mining through an E-Trade account, through a traditional um, investment mechanism that a lot of people are much more comfortable with relative to opening up a Coinbase account and purchasing some Bitcoin or Ethereum or Litecoin. Uh, so we, we think this has advantages for all that to both to open up the doors of the crypto community to more and more investors that are comfortable with trading, buying and selling stocks. Want exposure, market. really, who want, want exposure, exposure to, yeah. Yeah, to crypto. Yeah, you have a, yeah. a bigger liquidity pool um, on the entire market. And yeah. you have a much simplified tax situation too. You know, I, I know if I buy at ten dollars and sell at twenty dollars in this amount of time, I know my capital gains, and yeah, I know my, I, you know, I know how to evaluate that very simply versus having to go through any tax implications on the crypto market end. Let me correct one thing that you said. Your you said you have registered shares. Your share. Your you're a private company. We are right? a private company. Okay. Okay. Yes. So let's just let's just be clear with that. Um, okay. Um, well, that's very. <laughs> let's make sure we're compliant here on the podcast. Oh, we're a fully compliant podcast. Um, Might last have question. Have yeah. that disclaimer in now. Uh, right, that's right. Um, um, last question, uh, Tom. Let me ask you this. So why? So it does feel like there are characteristics of a fund um, in block stake. You're you're primarily you you you're from what I understand. You know, a small percentage, 5% of your overall capital is in effect for operating expenses and the balance is actually directly invested in tokens. Um, you, didn't, you didn't set it up as a fund. Why a corporate structure? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic question um, and it, it was a very difficult one, but I, the idea behind this business was to kind of... Um, get the masses involved outside of crypto. Um, and really the best way to do that is to run an operating business that generates revenue that um, looks like other businesses in the world. Um, we decided not to go with the fund structure because uh, it's an oversaturated area to begin with. Um, and quite frankly, uh, we wanted this to open the doors between crypto and the rest of the world. We didn't want to make um, a number of very high net worth investors a lot more money because quite frankly that's not really what the ethos of um, this whole movement is about anyway. Uh, and, and the reason for that is you can't publicly list a fund. Correct. And I, and I think we get tripped up here a little bit. Basically our business is um, identifying projects, providing them with the capital and the infrastructure that they need to grow into bigger networks. And I think there are a lot of other businesses that do exactly that, probably yourself included, but they're just not necessarily dealing with owning a liquid token. And so with owning that liquid token, I think we automatically get kind of characterized into um, being some sort of like investment fund. But in reality, holding that token uh, is no different than having some sort of incentive or long-term benefit from having um, a business relationship with somebody. So the token is just kind of a new form of... Um, Collateral, really. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Um, let me uh, sort of shift gears a little bit. Um, and and uh, just in the last few minutes of, of time we have. Um, so as I alluded to at the, at the... Just maybe step back into the broader, broader blockchain ecosystem. And as I alluded to at the top of the pod... Um, there has been a significant pullback. I mean, we saw, just to take Bitcoin, we saw Bitcoin prices hit 16, maybe even 17,000 back in December. They're down to the low sixes. Uh, Dash, we mentioned that coin, that's gone from uh, 1,300 to 200. To 210 and dropping. 
Um, Ethereum's dropped. I mean, all the coins have dropped. EOS was, I think, as high as 15. It's now seven. Mm -hmm. um, what do you guys think is going on? Was it was it simply hype? Was, was it are we are we more seeing now leveling? Um, what's your what's your take and 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 how do you think this bodes for the future? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a combination of factors, namely it, it has to do with the hype cycle. Um, I think when you look at any of these sort of uh, markets, basically what we saw was nobody knew what Bitcoin was 18 months ago. Um, we saw it on every CNBC episode for about two or three months at the end of summer. Um, and at that time, you had all of these uh, venture capital firms that missed out on, you know, the Facebook. blockchain 1.0, okay. okay. right. um, they're all pouring in. And so naturally you have sort of this um, hype bubble that comes. Um, and really it's just been a, a lack of liquidity since I think all the people that wanted to buy it did buy. It got completely ballooned up. Those marginal buyers that came in at 18K, they weren't in it for the right reasons. They had no sufficient sort of, um, you know, they were weak hands. Um, and, I, and I think we're seeing kind of a progression of that. I, I actually think that this pullback has been quite healthy. Um, a lot of the behavior I saw specifically in the ICO market in the past years just didn't make sense to me. Um, and I, I, again, I think that's one of the reasons why I really was drawn to the proof of stake and uh, masternode sort of area of this ecosystem was you're dealing with a lot of projects that aren't going out and raising $100 million to build a project in 24 months from now. Um, what we're kind of looking at more are projects that already exist. They're working um, and they raise money by They're increasing post -launch. the value of their token. Are, are you in only post-launch networks? In other words, do, do you have tokens of networks that have not yet had their launch? Yes, yes. we do own okay. some, but I mean, I would say just as an investor, right? Like that's the biggest risk hurdle. So why would I throw, you know, two hundred million dollars at a network that doesn't exist when I can invest in a lot of these great master node networks, which have a network that's working? They have thousands of nodes, you know, close to a hundred thousand transactions per day on their network. One, it's a lot easier to value. Two, the the market cap of those coins compared to some of these bigger coins like Dash, it's you know pennies on the dollar. So I think we're gonna to continue to actually see what you're talking about. I think all of the proof of work coins outside of say Bitcoin and Monero, I think they're all just gonna to continue to bleed because um, you know the, there's just no new marginal buyer and they got just so overvalued um, to an extent that they just, you know, you can't keep the momentum going. And when you know, at a time like now, maximum pessimism, at least for us, is the time of maximum opportunity. Sure. Yep. Yep. What What, uh, what are you What are you day keeping your eye on in terms of some of the networks that that, that, that you're looking at? Um, without meaning to ask you to give away your special sauce, but <laughs> anything you can talk about, like or characteristics of things that you guys like, that you're monitoring, that you're thinking about. Yeah. So when we in a part of our research pro process, when we do look at potential investment opportunities, specifically within the Masternode community, is we look at uh, what their code is. And it's not necessarily a technical aspect of reading a code line by line, but it's, okay, what is the block and the reward structure? Because everything has a fixed inflationary schedule. And, you know, while it's attractive, some of these networks boast they have, you know, a, a thousand percent ROI every year from their mining rewards. That's a great number. But what's that going to do to the value of each token? It's just going to plummet the value of the token. So it, we look for a combination of a, a healthy inflationary schedule that's not too drastic, that's, but that's still going to give us good rewards, but that provides a, a useful service. So sports betting is a good example. Another project we're very excited about is a GIN. That's G-I-N. Uh, so what GIN provides is a platform for hosting other master nodes, uh, which is really quite creative because they're taking what's a uh, technically difficult process to set up a master node on your own, both in running the code and having the server space. So Jin provides server space uh, and a platform to host your master nodes on. So you spoke about Dash before, so Dash, Pivx. Uh, there's a lot of um, Apollon, Tom spoke about. There's Stipe a, and Smart Cash. Yeah, th th there's a lot of these 
quote, legacy and new and developing national projects that are being hosted on Jin's platform. So what Jin allows you to do is you still own your money, so you still own your thousand dash uh, in your wallet, but you connect your wallet. Again, that's held securely by you. They don't have access to your funds, but they provide you with the server space. They provide the software program that runs in the background that verifies the transaction that enables you to be a node of the network to process the transaction to maintain the ledger. Uh, they provide that service and they call it a one-click setup. It's almost like a browser. It, like a almost like that, browser. yeah. It's a so it's a yeah. it's a platform, yeah. you know, if you want to use the Napster analogy, it's like the, the platform program you download for the that. Exactly. So yeah. they, they provide that service in exchange for a fee, right? They're entitled to receive a fee in exchange for their services. So they collect their fee in their own native token, Jincoin. Uh, w which we, we think is a pretty creative, smart idea. And like Tom was speaking about earlier, it just makes more sense to integrate a native uh, token into that process versus bringing in dollars or even Bitcoin or Ethereum into that process. It runs seamlessly. So by being, we both host GIN nodes of our own uh, that support yeah, the GIN network. We're one of the biggest uh, master node holders on the GIN network. Uh, and just to like, Humble brag a little bit, like we found this network before it was listed on most of the um, pricing indexes. We're in like it's close to three dollars, and in the time that we've gotten in it, it's been listed on all of the major listing sites. Number of new nodes has exploded. It's gone up, you know, 250, 300 um, percent. Oh, fantastic! So, so, so to crystallize the gin conversation, and maybe to extrapolate it, um, the bet with gin is that masternode mining is going to increase in popularity Bingo. and yep. then you're right. Okay. And, and they're so providing a real life service. Yep. It's yep. not just that yep. there's many great projects that will someday say they're going to provide this service or do this function, but they're doing it right they're now. Doing it. So we're looking for and projects that are, that are built, that are actually functioning and not just a promise of something smart may happen in the future. Okay. Yeah, and betting on Jin is basically betting on the Masternode ecosystem, which is exactly what we're about. Let me wrap up by asking you guys each to just, if you can identify any long-term trends, not necessarily specific networks, but with respect to blockchain over the next 20, 12 to 24 months. What, 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 do you, what, do you, what do you look it out for? Well, uh, a little so, bit of a vague question, I realize. Yeah, yeah. So, so what, like Tom was saying, we're, we're both, frankly, pretty excited about the, the current pullback right now is, you know, we're long-term believers. And so I'm okay with, you know, Bitcoin um, hovering around the 6,000 mark relative to it almost hit 20,000 last year. Um, you know, it's an opportunity. We see it as a short-term opportunity for ourselves. Um, but, you know, we see a, a widespread adoption of cryptocurrency or crypto assets, the tokenization of the different platforms happening. And then we also expect, and you see in the news headlines and the, you know, some of the, the financial blogs and websites that there's going to be more and more of these um, publicly traded financial instruments. So there's future markets for Bitcoin already that came out last uh, over the winter. Um, there's supposedly in the process several different crypto ETFs that are going to become traded on on the various exchanges. I think NASDAQ is talking about having one. Um, so there's all these uh, publicly traded tools that supposedly are coming out and, and certainly Blockstake wants to be one of them as we spoke about earlier. Uh, but we think these are, these are going to open the doors to more and more investors, more people that are comfortable buying an ETF or buying a, a stock on an exchange and being another way to onboard capital. And bring institutional market, money in. Bring too. institutional money bring private That's money, you yeah. know, as we, it, you know, becomes included in some, you know, even broader ETFs. Um, you know, it's a great way for people to diversify their personal portfolios of, of risk and opportunity that way. Yeah. So, you know, we really see a growth in the capital market side of the crypto world being a, a giant portal that's, it's open already, but we see it becoming bigger and bigger and wider and wider in the not too distant future. And we're quite excited about that, and we want to be a participant and supporter of that too. And I think Tom can talk a little bit more on some of the, you know, the projects and the other use cases that are out there that we think blockchain as a technology is continuing to solve more and more problems and to be a more efficient solution, you know, like something that's sports betting, that's okay. easily relatable. Tom, I'll give you the last word. 
Yeah, so I, I think that the, this whole idea of blockchain, uh, the way I kind of like to think of it is if we are building upon the internet, uh, blockchain enables uh, the, the transfer of value or the ability to you know, transfer money through the internet. And so you know, by creating this trust, blockchain is really like the best Lego block to you know, build on top of. Um, and it was sort of the Lego block that we've been missing since the start of the internet. Um, where do I see this going in like the next 12 to 14 months? Um, I think that that hype bubble kind of has taken away a lot of the attention that there's so much development work going on. Um, and there was so much capital that was put into this market a year ago. Um, the next 12 to 14 months, really the crucial things are, can we clarify the custody solutions? How can investment banks, pension funds, et cetera, get into this market? Because right now it's very specialized to hedge funds, like uh, you know, angel investors, et cetera. Um, so that, that's one challenge. But I, I do think that in the future, um, this blockchain technology is gonna be basically the underpinning of most applications that people use, um, you know, things like uh, Uber, uh, Facebook. I think these are all models that can be reimagined, um, that can be owned by a network instead of the management team of a company. Yeah, and, and, the, inv and the, the investors, um, certainly taking on profits. Um, so I'm very bullish on it. Okay, term. good. It's just a matter of the timeline. Well, we shall see. And uh, with that, I, I really want to thank you guys. This has been, I think, hopefully entertaining and enlightening. Uh, for people, we would love to have you guys back at some point to update on how Blockstake's doing. And uh, thanks very much for coming in. Thanks, thanks. Great. Thanks, Tom. And that's a wrap. That's a wrap on this episode of The Medium Rules with Alan Baldishin. For more information, go to our website at www.hballp.com. And you can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And don't forget to rate us on Apple Podcasts.